We're going to be talking more about the crisis in Europe, what it means for markets and investors. We've assembled a Taking Stock Think Tank. We have Jay Pulaski from J2Z Advisory. Last time he was on, he was telling people to buy U.S. government bonds. Also, we've got Steve Blitz, director and senior economist at ITG Investment Research. He's been wary about where markets are headed. And also, Dennis Hines, chief market strategist, RW Pressbridge. Dennis has been on the record as saying, sell the rallies. All right, gentlemen, good to have you with us. I want to begin by talking with you, Jay Pelosi. Tell us about what's going on with U.S. Treasuries. 1.92% if you want to loan your money to the U.S. government for 10 years. Well, I think, Pim, it's pretty simple. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty in the marketplace. And when that happens, uh, the U.S. Treasury market is going to be a beneficiary. And particularly with Europe uh, really looking like it's imploding, I think you're seeing a lot of money, offshore money, and you can see that in the U.S. dollar euro exchange rate coming into the U.S. market. And it's obviously not going into stocks. It's going into treasuries. And most of, most of all, uh, it's telling us that growth is going to be weak. And we had Ben Bernanke speak this week. We had the e ECB conference, and we had uh, President Obama last night, and the market has told us that the, sum, the summation of those three presentations is that we're not going to be able to get ourselves out of this anytime soon, and that's bearish for growth, bearish for stocks, bullish for treasuries. All right, bearish for growth, bearish for stocks, bullish for treasuries, Steve Blitz. Can you explain how this operation works with the Federal Reserve buying U.S. treasuries? The government of the United States prints IOUs. They sell them to the Federal Federal Reserve, right. then they pay the interest on those IOUs to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve says, see, we've lowered interest rates, we've borrowed all of this uh, firepower, we've got it locked away in our drawer. How does this help anybody's real economy? Well, it doesn't really. I mean, it, it, it's had its effect which is that interest rates are low and they really can't go very much lower. But I'm talking lower for the U.S. government because most people talk about lack of access, lack of liquidity if you're a company, if you're a bank, if you're an individual. Well, I mean, the, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, whose liquidity you're talking about. I mean, the federal government can borrow at extremely low rates. Right. In fact, one of the arguments for the uh, government to get involved in a very large infrastructure program, like a Hoover Dam kind of thing, is that you can borrow at extremely low rates and get a very high return on your investment down the road. Of course, that's not going to happen. That's not what uh, President Obama suggested uh, last night. As far as corporations concerned, you know, everyone talks about uh, the huge amount of cash balances the large corporations have and waiting for them to spend it. To be honest, I think a large large amount of that cash on hand is not so much money waiting to be spent, but they've internalized the banking process for themselves. I think their fear really is that it, when they need the cash, they can't go to the banks, they can't go to the capital markets and get it. And they've just internalized that financing function for themselves. Yeah, because if you're a corporate treasurer, your job is on the line. The company comes to you and says, all right, you got to do some short-term funding. And you find out the commercial paper market might be locked up. You might not have access to short-term liquidity. And as a result, you want to be able to say to anybody in the company, the CFO, the chief executive, don't worry, we've got the cash. We've got it for you. Right. And I think that's a large part. It's not a 100%, but I think a very large part of the large balances that corporations are, uh, are carrying are exactly for that purpose. All right, Dennis Hines, corporate balance sheets, they're rich with cash, but don't expect them to spend it anytime soon. Jay Pulaski says we're bearish for stocks, we're bearish for growth, bullish for treasuries. You've been saying get out of stocks on any rally. You still sticking with it? Yes, yes. However, I do think, uh, as, as both of uh, your guests are talking about, um, where we stand right now, we know one thing is about to happen. And I believe that QE3 is, is just nigh or nearby. And what's happened is that we have this great short covering rally here in anticipation of Mr. Obama saying something uh, worthwhile and good for the economy, as with uh, Mr. Bernanke. So we've passed that, and now people have gotten frightened. They're seeing things in Europe uh, going uh, badly. Uh, and so here, now the moment is here, and the die is set for us to have the uh, Mr. Bernanke come to the aid of the world by coming up with QE3. Now, will it have the same impact? It will clearly, it will clearly ignite short covering. And that short covering can sometimes beget further buying. 
Is it temporary? Yes, it is. But nonetheless, it is not to be ignored. All right, we're going to continue the conversation because Ben Bernanke has still got to deal with those other members of the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, and they're not so sure about more stimulus funding. We're going to continue our conversation. Uh, Dennis Hines, you were talking about what the Federal Reserve is going to do. You think that Ben Bernanke is going to initiate another quantitative easing or stimulus program. Where's he going to get the money to do this? Well, he does it the way he has always done it. He simply prints it. Okay, and he will continue to do that. There have been objections last time around. There were three very vocal dissenters. Last time he, he indicated that he wanted to do more of this uh, money printing. Well, as I suggest to you, three people, as potent as they may be, is uh, nothing when you compare it against. You mean the three dissenters the of the Federal Open Market Committee? Versus the populace of this country and in Europe. Uh, there is no alternative uh, that, uh, that that is in the foreseeable future except to do more of the same. All right, so Jay Pulaski, come in on this topic because it seems as though if the Federal Reserve is going to be the uh, continuing buyer of uh, U.S. Treasuries, why don't you sell them some? You think you own a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I think our, our, our discussion is in the right path. The, the Fed is going to act. It's going to have to act in some fashion. And last time it acted, we had an equity market melt up in the fall of last year. My point is that this year we're going to have a bond yield meltdown. And we've already had a large part of that. We've gone from 430 on the 30 year uh, less than two months ago to 330 today. And I, I think we can go further. I think we're going to break 3% on the 30 year bond. But obviously, we're getting close, uh, closer to the end of that process. The problem really is, Pim, I think, for investors, we're setting up for a period of really struggling to find yield. There is a tremendous amount of money in the pension space, in the endowment space, that's built off a 5 to 7% return per per annum target base. And you can't find 5 to 7 percent. You're going to have to go around the world to really find yield. And, and if investors can find that spot first, that's how you're going to make money in this market. All right. Well, let's go a little bit around the world. I want to bring in Julie Hyman, our chief markets correspondent. And Julie, you've got some headlines coming out of the G7 finance ministers meeting that's taking place in Marseille, France. It is. And uh, the minister's coming out, not making a very dramatic statement here, but saying there is the need for a concern concerted effort to support growth. Uh, they say they're committed to strong, stable global financial system. And they say uh, they see a need for ambitious, growth-friendly budget deficit cuts. Um, I'm not sure what growth-friendly budget deficit cuts entail exactly, Pim, since a lot of the talk has been that if you, uh, if you do cut down on, uh, on deficits, that can be a little bit limiting to growth, and that's certainly what austerity has seemed to cause in Europe already. I mean, I guess I would ask whether you're looking at the Fed or you're looking at the ECB or you're looking at the U.S. administration or the European administration, is there anything that these guys can meaningfully do? I mean, another round of quantitative easing perhaps would help on the margins, but is there anything that can meaningfully be done to change the direction of the global economy? It doesn't seem like investors think so at this point. Steve Blitz, I mean, I'm sure it sounds a lot better in French when they say it, but I mean, is there really any hope coming out of the G7 meeting like this? Well, there is and there isn't. I mean, the truth of the, re the, truth of the politics of it is there isn't. Um, I think there's two things to think about. One is shorter term, I think the Fed's hand's going to get moved very quickly um, because of what's going on in Europe with the banking system. I would not be surprised if the twist, so to speak, on QE3 uh, is something where they shore up the capital of U.S. banks um, and directly. How does that work, twist? I mean, the idea being that the Federal Reserve sells some of their short-term U.S. Treasuries and they buy longer dated right, debt, right. so that flattens the yield curve. That but the, the banks curve. are going to get crushed. The margins on their business are going to decline. Yeah, but what I think the Fed's going to do, actually, is they're going to come in directly and, and put the money, rather than buy necessarily buy Treasuries, I think they'll come in and buy equity or put in equity stake directly into U.S. banks to shore up the capital. And I think that's out there. There's a Fed working paper, two Fed working papers, in fact, that were produced in the spring talking how that actually has a better impact on the economy than going out and buying treasury. So I think that's in the back of their mind and a banking crisis out of Europe is going to uh, is certainly going to help them in that regard. Dennis Hines, what do investors do at this moment? 
Uh, what we do is you follow the template of the Japanese, and the Japanese have faced this same problem for two decades, and what we need to do is what have they done? They've been dealing with zero interest rates for a very long time, so what the, you've come up with innovative, innovative methods. You go to, you seek out the currencies which have the highest interest rate, Brazil, for example, and you do the carry trade. You buy, you borrow, uh, you borrow cheaply in Japan, and what you do is you invest expensively in other places. Now, the problem with that is that they've been increasing that and turning Turbocharging this with something called double deckers, which means is that you then, in addition to doing that trade, you then buy the currency and at multiples, and you create some wonderful returns. However, if the currency that you're buying, okay, weakens, you're in trouble. We got to leave it there, gentlemen. I want to thank you very much.